Hello, and welcome to the 2012 League of Women Voters Election Forum. I'm the moderator, Murray Farber, a former newspaper and TV news editor. We're pleased that candidates have joined us today so that you can learn where they stand in the election to be held November 6th. The League of Women Voters does not support nor oppose any candidate or political party. Before I introduce the candidates, I'll explain our format. We will give each candidate a minute to tell you about themselves in an opening statement. Then we'll get to the questions for one minute answers with 30 second rebuttals where appropriate. The order in which they speak was determined earlier. They were not given any peeks at the questions in advance. And at the closing, the candidates will offer a one minute statement. So here we go with Darren Miller and Luis Chavez from Area 2 for the uh, Unified School Board. Fresno Unified School Board. And there is a third candidate, Esmeralda uh, Diaz, Diaz, but who is not with us today. So let us begin um, with Darren. Um, tell us about yourself, Darren, and uh, why are you the better candidate for this uh, position? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the League of Women Voters <coughs> for this opportunity to um, state my, my views and, and the reasons why I'm running for this, uh, to be a, a trustee for Fresno Area, Fresno Unified Area 2. Um, I'm born and raised in Fresno, a Fresno Unified product, a parent of Fresno Unified students. Um, I've been working in education for the last 22 years. Uh, currently, I work as a high school counselor at Madera High School, just to the north of us. Um, I think a combination of my year, 22 years of experience in education um, and that I've lived in Area 2 for the last 43 years, um, going up in the Butler Park area of Area 2 and currently residing in, on Huntington Boulevard, um, uniquely qualifies me um, to be a trustee in this area, having an understanding of educational issues um, and what, what faces our students face on a daily basis as far as budgeting um, and other factors, suspensions, dropout rates. Um, as well as knowing the, the community and what, what, what drives the community, um, what impact, negative impacts there are there. I think I'm a great candidate to be able to address those factors. Luis? Well, first of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this uh, uh, event together. I think it's important to communi communicate to the community uh, who their trustee will be and what they can expect from them should they be elected. Uh, Luis Chavez, candidate for the Area 2. I uh, graduated from Roosevelt. I'm a product of Fresno Unified. I'm also a parent of uh, two daughters currently in the, in the school district. And uh, growing up there in the, my community, uh, I always saw a need, uh, a need to engage in public service. And I think my professional uh, track record shows that. I've, ha I've got a track record of working in the community, uh, particularly the area that uh, I will be serving. Uh, and for me, I see this as an opportunity to give back. Uh, I know that oftentimes the headlines uh, make it seem like our community is full of just a lot of people that uh, are, have, happen to have dropped out, but I've always uh, believed in the, uh, the, the, the goals of our, our community should be to provide more opportunities and resources, and that's what I believe I'll bring to that school board should I be elected. There are lots of challenges that are going to face you, uh, no matter who gets elected. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you give us, a, say, two main challenges that you see facing Fresno Unified School District, and maybe briefly describe how you would handle these issues? And let's start with you, Luce. Sure. Um, you know, as I've gone door to door and, and, and talked to a lot of the constituents, a lot of the parents and uh, members of the community, uh, the two major issues that we have out there are obviously the dropout rate uh, that we currently have with the school district um, and also the lack of uh, vocational training programs that uh, are not being offered to our students. And I think they go hand in hand. Uh, what one of my priorities would be would be to expand the vocational training programs that are currently offered to students, particularly at, at Roosevelt uh, area. When I was going to Roosevelt, uh, we had shop, we had uh, welding classes, we had automotive. And I think that's one of the things that we need to focus on, providing more of these opportunities uh, for our, our students because the options for those that do not uh, complete uh, their education are horrific. And a lot of children are depending on whether or not Fresno <coughs> Unified remains true to that mission statement of ensuring that every child receives a good quality education. And that will be my approach on that school board. Thank you, Darren. Well, I, th I agree with Lewis. Those are two issues that need to be addressed. But I would address them through two, dif two different alternative ways. One is that we have to increase the communication. Um, as I walk around and meet with constituents in Area 2, there's a lot of disconnect. Um, we've got a lot of 
EL parents we heard from last night at the forum, where they just don't understand why their kids are still in the ELD program, why they're not matriculating through the system. And it's a lack of communication, a lack of information that's being provided to parents as well as the students. As so well, as a trustee, I want to make sure that, uh, in particular, the constituents of Area 2 are, uh, are engaged, um, not just setting up forums where they're coming out to listen to me as a trustee or some other person, district level administrator from the district, but where we're reaching out and going out into the community, such as the Mosqueda Centers and Holmes Playground, Romaine Playground, these other community center places to go and engage the community. Um, the second area I think that needs to be addressed is how the monies and resources are being allocated. Um, far too many resources are not being sent directly to the classroom um, to improve in that engagement between the students and, and the teachers in the classroom. So I would also want to address that. Thank you. This year we're voting on two propositions dealing with um, increasing money available uh, to help schools and other parts of the community, Propositions 30 and 38. 30 has been endorsed by the California Teachers Association and 38 has been endorsed by the California Parent Teachers Association. Um, which proposition do you support and why? And let's start with you, Darren. Well, I voted for Proposition 30, um, and the reason I voted for that is that um, the increase in money um, that comes directly to the school sites is going to benefit all students, it's going to benefit um, all employees. There are provisions right now in the California Ed Code where if 30 does not pass, schools will, school districts will have an opportunity to lessen the school year by 15 school days. Um, currently, students go to school 180 days. That would give school districts an opportunity to, to, le to lower that level, the number of days to 165. That is totally tragic and that's totally in the opposite direction of what we should be doing. And so that's one of the main reasons why I'm supporting um, measure, or not measure, but Proposition 30. The other side of it is, is that it is short term. There is a seven year window, um, there is an uh, opening and a sunset on it, whereas 38, um, is not, there is no sunset. Um, it is something that would go into permanent status and as we all know, the, the economy is going to change, and so these types of propositions will allow us to change with, those, with the ending of that proposition. Louis? Yeah, I, I also uh, support uh, Prop 30, but one of the reasons that, that I do is because it also includes um, our additional resources for um, students in community college, uh, Fresno State University, and I think uh, as a community, we have to come together and invest, and that's, that's how I see that proposition as an investment in our uh, future because if we don't educate our, our youth now we're going to pay for it later and we all we all know how that relates to the cycle of poverty and gangs and violence and instead of sending our our youth to prisons we should really focus on educating them because that's how we're going to have them come to our community and give back um, one of the things that that also saw about proposition 30 was that um, like darren mentioned it does have a a, a sunset uh, and we can't just simply throw money at a problem. We have to actually secure tangible, measurable results that we can get. And I think as a district, we have an opportunity when allocating those resources to make sure that we're serving X amount of students, but what kind of results are we doing on closing that achievement gap and making sure that our students can read and write at great level. Thank you. We know that um, effective teaching is critical to help the children in, in every classroom. And Current practices call for teacher evaluation through uh, achievement tests, uh, gains on these standardized tests, and also through um, classroom observations. Uh, how can these evaluations be even more meaningful? Uh, are there other factors that should be included? Um, should these evaluations be done by trained professionals out from outside the school district? Um, Let's start with you, Luis, on sure. where do we go on this? Sure. I, you know, part of my professional background is doing program evaluation on a yearly basis for a nationwide organization, and, and I think that's important. What we should do, though, is, is, is adopt a comprehensive evaluation approach to where you're not just uh, assigning or correlating a specific test uh, score to the performance of a child. I think other measures should be taken into account, reading and writing at grade level, um, cognitive critical thinking as well. I think those are also indicators that should be aware. So I do favor a comprehensive uh, plan, but we also have to combine that with resources for our teachers. I think if we don't give our teachers those resources, we're essentially setting them up to fail. And I'm all for having high expectations uh, so that regardless of who comes to our schools, there's high quality teaching and learning going on at every single school site. 
So it needs to be a comprehensive approach that we can adopt as a school district, and I think that's where there's an opportunity for that board to really develop and, and, and implement a policy that will address those needs. Karen? Well, the elements that you talked about as far as evaluation are mandated. Um, it's mandated that teachers, tenure teachers go through evaluative processes every other year and that all temporary teachers and what's called pro probationary ones and twos go through an evaluation every year. So those, those elements are mandated in there. One of the things that has not happened with that evaluation process is, is that the accountability is not there. There are certain elements, you know, with, with your site administrators. It's up, one of their tasks is, is making sure that they come up with a comprehensive timeline of how they're getting these evaluations done. Unfortunately, the accountability doesn't go with that and evaluations wind up being a rushed process and it's not a learning apparatus for the teachers um, in their engagement in, with their students. And so what I would want to do is make sure that I address the evaluation piece by making sure that we have quality site leadership that understands the value that goes along with the evaluative process. Maybe coming up with a creative way of having peer evaluations, which can't be part of the formal evaluation, but you can take that information and data, third grade teachers helping to evaluate third grade teachers and so on, um, to make the, comp the, the process comprehensive. There's con continuing concern over graduation rates and the graduation task force has re recommended uh, collaboration among the students, parents, um, various stakeholders, and community-based organizations. Um, in what ways would you work with the administration and with the um, partner with these community-based organizations? And I'd like to start with you, Darren, to talk about that. Dealing with the dropout problem in high, at the high school level, even at the middle school level, is triage. By that time, the damage is done. Students have developed negative attendance patterns. Uh, parents have been disengaged with their supportive levels. So if we're waiting until they get into seventh grade and beyond to address the, the dropout problem, we've missed. Um, we, we've very, well, the district will be very limited in what it can do. So what happens is if we want to address negatively uh, or in positively impact with those on with graduation, we have to do it at a much earlier level. Everyone knows that if, you, if students are not reading by the third grade, um, their likelihood of graduation goes down. Um, and so I would want to start identifying students who have attendance problems, those uh, parents who are non-supportive at the earlier grade levels and the elementary levels, and then developing some type of support system, whether it be through the individual school sites or whether it be parenting, using parent university or some other community-based organizations to make sure that we're providing parents with knowledge and support to be able to support their children. Therese? Well, uh, having, having worked for um, CBOs, community-based organizations in the past and, and doing some work uh, for them, I understand the value that they bring to our community. And I think one of the things that we need to do right now specifically where all of us have had a cut back on our, on our family budget, I think what we need to do is leverage those resources. A uh, couple of quick examples, one of the things that there's opportunity for is for a lot of these community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to partner with the school district and provide after-school programs, uh, literacy programs, pa pa par parent empowerment uh, programs as well, I think are, are going to go a long way for really stretching those dollars. And that's essentially what we need to do right now. It's leverage those resources and make sure that anything we do is with the best interest of our, of our children. And one of the things that I like to do is there's no reason why our, our schools should be closed during the summer. And there are actually already nonprofit organizations that have actually wanted to um, take, take that lead and take that role in opening up the park space for uh, our residents there. So those are some of the partnerships that I'm looking to, to work with on, on that board. Or if I may, is this an opportunity for me to sure, do a rebuttal? Go ahead, sure, please. One other piece I want to add on there also is that the, the graduation task force that was just initiated with Brother Unified missed a, a great opportunity to be able to impact what goes on with the negative graduation rate. They had the task force, I don't know, 30 or 40 members of that, and they did not have a parent of a dropout student, nor did they have a dropout student actually in the de decision-making body. So when you go back to my earlier point about communication, I think those are the avenues that needs to happen. We've got to get people who are directly affected by what's going on with this engaged at the decision-making table. Any other thoughts that you want to get into on this? Sure. Um, just to expand a little bit on that, I think that the way that we're going to really uh, address a lot of the challenges in our community are by partnering not just with CBOs, but with business groups, with, 
with a lot of the different organizations that are already doing a lot of great work in our community and you know the way we're going to improve things is you bring all the different stakeholders to the table and you sit them around and you get a little bit of input from them and input from from you know all the sides and then you come up with the best solution to address the needs of our kids and that's what we need to do and that's what our, our campaign has been about is about building broad coalitions and collaborations that I think we'll, we're going to really be uh, useful uh, on that school board. Let's talk some more about dropout. Um, on this issue, there are some people who feel that it's due to the lack of um, vocational opportunities, vocational training opportunities. Um, some say it's due to the students' lack of interest in college-based curriculum. Um, what should school board members be doing to possibly in increase this kind of career training and these other areas to um, improve our dropout rate? Uh, Lewis, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I had an opportunity to look at, at, at the, the district budget and there, there was only f uh, about $500,000 allocated for uh, vocational training programs. And I've had discussions with uh, members of the community, parents and such, where they feel that um, not every child is going to go to, to college. And there's an overemphasis on that. And what we need to do as a, as a, as a board is, is really make sure that we give our students more options. Uh, and what I mean by that is that by the time that our students leave our, our district, they should be able to either gain a, a employment in the, in the workplace or uh, pursue a two-year or a four-year university uh, education. And if we expand the vocational training programs, I think that will allow students that traditionally don't like to uh, pursue an, would like to pursue an academic um, uh, goal to get hands-on experience. Uh, and I think that'll serve them well. You know, I was the beneficiary of that. I learned the construction trade uh, right after high school, and it allowed me a way to pay through college, uh, so to speak. So we should really, as a board, outline priorities. And, you know, there's an old saying in budgeting that says, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value, and I believe in that. Darren? Well, I agree with Luis that there needs to be, students need to have additional options. I mean, it's human nature to not want to do the same thing as, as your neighbor. And so unfortunately in Fresno Unified, the fourth largest school district in, in the state of California, serving about 70,000 students, when you identify that they have seven comprehensive high schools that they're funneling those 70,000 students through, you've got about 10,000 students per um, high school area track. Um, that's too many students. Um, that's too many students being funneled through not enough options. And so if you look at any other major metropolitan area as far as their school systems, they have offerings. They have offerings such as um, School of the Arts, which is not combined with other comprehensive high schools, they're a standalone school. And so one of the other areas, um, as we've gone around with my campaign, is one of the things that President Unified has to do is build capacity. Um, whether it's building new comprehensive schools, which is, provides all services, or whether it's specialized high, uh, high schools, such as what goes on with Duncan Polytechnical, which has a 97% graduation rate. That shows you that that type of model is working. And so we need to find ways to mimic what is going on with that at the high school throughout the rest of the district. As I said at the outset, there are many challenges, and I wish there was more time for us to get into areas such as preschool uh, education, get into the issues of uh, uh, problems of English learners, but uh, our time is up, and in behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank the candidates, but first give them a chance to wrap up with a, a one-minute statement. And since we started with uh, Lewis, why don't we uh, start with the uh, no, we start actually with, with Darren. So let's go with Lewis this time. <laughs> Doris and Le D Darren and Lewis. The Lewis. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, just want to close by saying I want to thank again the League of Women Voters for putting this on. And, you know, one of the things that the voters should consider about me is that I've got a broad range of experience that I think will serve me well. I've done some work with policy uh, at the county, at the city level. I worked in the private sector. I've been a teacher at Fresno City College. So I have that broad range of experience that for me, this is something personal and serving my community. I have a vested interest in my community. I lived in the same home for 18 years. I currently have children that attend schools in the district. And I believe that that is going to be um, a good factor in considering for, for the voters who, who they feel would best represent their, their interest on that board. And I feel I'm the candidate to do that. And I want to thank uh, uh, the voters out there for a the, 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 lot of the great ideas that they've given me. And I'm going to keep working hard until November 6th. Thank you. There. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank the League of Women Voters for this opportunity to, to share my thoughts and my viewpoints and my desire to serve my community, which I've been associated with for the last 43 years. Um, as I said, I think the, my combination of 22 years of experience working in 
K-12 education um, in various school districts, including Fresno Unified. I had an opportunity of serving as a vice principal at Fresno High School, Edison High School, and at Kings Canyon Middle School. So I understand, have an intimate knowledge and understanding of what goes on, the inner workings of Fresno Unified. My experiences of working on different committees, serving Southeast Fresno, in particular the Roosevelt High School area, um, being an alumnus from there, still involved with the Alumni Association there, um, makes me um, very uniquely qualified and uniquely experienced to be the next trustee serving um, Area 2 for Fresno Unified. Um, I also would like to thank the, the, the voters and the neighborhoods that I've had an opportunity to go through. As Louis said, there's been a lot of great ideas um, that have come from the, from the conversations I've had. But one thing I want people to understand is that I'm not just running to win this race, I'm running to serve the area that served me very well. Thank you. Well, our time is running out. And again, in behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank you for coming here today, share your views. And I want to thank Community Media Access Collaborative for providing the facilities. Now, it's your turn out there to be a good citizen and vote on Tuesday, November 6th. If you have any questions about voting procedures, the county clerk's office will be glad to assist you. You can phone 559-600-8683 or email the clerk and the um, address is right on the screen. So it's clerk-elections at ca.fresno.ca.us. So thank you and remember to vote.